following is a special presentation of Way 31 News. The unthinkable, the sexual abuse of a child. I was abused from the ages of five to seven. Innocence stolen from the most helpless among us and families left shattered. I'll never forget sitting in court and, and I'll never forget a mom's face. And it happens more often than you think. The prevalence of it is definitely higher than I expected it to be, I think. What every parent needs to know, shattered innocence. Now here's Megan Reyna and Luke Hydash. You've probably heard of it. Your city probably has one, a child advocacy center, a place for victims of child sexual abuse to go. What if we told you the idea behind these centers started here in Huntsville, Alabama, off Lincoln Street in this house? What's known today as the National Child Advocacy Center laid the groundwork back in the 1980s for helping children who were sexually abused. Today, there are more than 1,000 child advocacy centers all across the United States with others in more than 34 countries across the world. And while the NCAC has moved on to a bigger, more fitting campus for them, still here in Huntsville, this home set the foundation for a countless number of victims to be able to tell their stories. Over the next half hour, we're going to go over just how prevalent the issue of child sex abuse is here in North Alabama, the resources available to victims and the families, and the efforts to make sure that these tragic situations never even happened in the first place. We were victimizing children all over again. Bud Kramer remembers the start of his career as Madison County DA, spending a bulk of his time prosecuting child abuse cases. I was a young district attorney. I was elected DA when I was 31, but I kind of wasn't afraid of anything. At that time, the National Children's Advocacy Center didn't exist. Nothing of its kind did. Children abused were forced to tell their story over and over again. Bud Kramer saw the broken process firsthand. We were losing them, our, our opportunity to provide services for them. So as DA, Kramer started to make change, change that would stretch well beyond Huntsville. Knew I needed a family-friendly environment to make that child and maybe the accompanying family member feel comfortable and feel at home. And that was not in my office in the courthouse. I wanted a base where my prosecutors could go, the social workers could go, the police could come to, therapists could come to that needed to talk about a child that they had in, in treatment, and even where medical exams could be done. So we were, could be a one-stop service center. We're doing what I never dreamed we could do. Kramer says his wake-up call to make this one-stop shop came after the story of a young girl named Tina abused by her mother's boyfriend, forced to tell her story over and over. It wore her out. And Kramer, the one prosecuting this case, was right there with her. What she went through, I went home one night after I really got into an interview with her with the help of a therapist. Once with her grandmother, I finally got her comfortable talking about this. And I had a child at home the same age. And I remember sitting there drinking a glass of wine thinking, I, I can't get this out of my head. This is, this is, this is so incredibly overwhelmingly disturbing that I can't, I can't leave this. This is Eileen from DHR. So Kramer started to think outside of the box. I can do this differently and I'm gonna do it differently. I don't know what other communities might be doing. I wanna find out. It was then he started the National Children's Advocacy Center at this small house in downtown Huntsville. You can see the porch of the house. A place where abused children could tell their story once and only once, recorded, in a safe environment with safe people. We're gonna wake up the rest of the country. People are coming here from all over the country to look at better ways to help. He prosecuted cases for years. He served in the United States House of Representatives. But for Kramer, all of that pales in comparison to the good work he did at the NCAC. It doesn't get any better than this. Everyone who works here is fueled by stories of survival. Stories like Margaret Holzer's, a Huntsville native, Olympic swimmer, and victim of sex abuse. Yes! A world record for Holzer! Beisel, a young Winning is in Margaret Holzer's genes. The Huntsville native breaking a world record, competing in the Olympics twice, winning both silver and bronze medals. But Holzer had a bigger goal beyond the winner's podium. She wanted to speak her truth. I would cry in my goggles. I would get mad at the pool. I would take it out on the water. In 2008, Holzer revealed when she was a young girl, she was molested. So I intentionally waited until the games were over 
Um, but I do think knowing that that was something I wanted to do and, and kind of having already made the decision to do it, it did take a lot of that pressure off, which I do think allowed me to, to compete at a higher level. I was abused from the ages of five to seven and it was by a good friend of mine's father. Holzer said this man was someone she trusted, someone who watched her and her sister often. This man was kind of like a big little kid. He was always an active participant in what we were doing. She knew at the time what was happening to her was wrong, but she was too young to know what to do. Ultimately, her abuse ended when the family moved away. It would be years later, while sitting in class, learning about sexual abuse, something clicked. We had it in Huntsville because of the National Children's Advocacy Center. Not long after that class, at 11 years old, she told someone for the first time. Well, my 11-year-old friend, um, who had had the same education as I had had, because we were in the same class, you know, she had the fortitude to look at me and go, wow, like, Margaret, you were molested. Following that conversation with her friend, she came to her mother, Elizabeth Livingston. It was everything a mother did not want to hear, but knew you needed to hear it immediately. Not knowing what to do, Livingston called 911. After talking with investigators, the family was told to make an appointment with the NCAC, so they did. Holzer did a forensic interview and only had to tell her story once. From there, police got involved. Her family wanted to press charges. Livingston admits it was stressful, but she didn't feel helpless. When you have a child, you can't turn to page 53 and go, oh, what do I do when my child's been molested? You know, I mean, I had, I didn't know what to do either. The case against Holzer's abuser was thrown out. They didn't have enough evidence. But Holzer was given counseling and her mother given reassurance this will not ruin their lives. It's absolutely essential. I owe a debt of gratitude to the kindness of the people and this still gets to me at this stage. Livingston still emotional because she knows without the NCAC, Holzer would not be the woman she is today. And while Holzer's time in the water may have given her a spotlight, God had a plan all along. God gave her a gift and the gift was to help her with her true passion, which is helping with child abuse. This is somebody I knew, this is someone I trusted. Margaret Holzer is, has been spreading her message of survival around the country, speaking at events and advocating for the NCAC. I had no idea, you know, how often this was happening. When a victim arrives at the NCAC, the goal for the people who work here is pretty simple, to help those who need it and then hand things off to prosecutors who want to get a conviction just like Bud Kramer did. And that starts in this room with a forensic interview. Investigators and prosecutors watching the child's story from the outside. A much less scary environment with a lot less people in this room. Law enforcement in here keeping a recording, writing down notes, starting a case. While inside, the forensic interviewer follows a strict protocol. We ask very non-leading questions. It's important that we are remain very neutral and we let the child tell us in their own words. Inside the room is just the child, the interviewer, sometimes even Wilson the facility dog, here to keep nerves away and the child calm. Once a case begins, the detective's goal is to serve justice, and oftentimes that means abusers find themselves here inside a jail. And the investigators who put these criminals here, to say they're busy, that would be an understatement. So we traveled all across North Alabama to take a look at these different agencies and see the trends they're seeing and the issues they face. I observe the ugly. Um, I deal with the ugly. It takes a special type of detective to deal with child abuse cases. In the eyes and ears for our children, I work behind the scenes uh, on these cases. Someone like Madison County investigator Crystal Bailey. Doesn't end. <laughs> mm. It doesn't end. You have to be motivated to be in this unit. The latest data from the Alabama Department of Human Resources reveals the amount of reported child abuse cases has gone up in the last year. But it's been a mainly upward trend for the past five years. In 2017, there was just more than 7,900 reported cases. It then spiked in 2018 to more than 8,900, dropping slightly over the next two years, partly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Kids were at home away from mandatory reporters like teachers and doctors. Then in 2021, there was more than 8,800 reported cases. I can tell you last week, I probably got 10 to 12 cases. We have gotten, I think, um, three or four just this week. DeKalb County investigator Priscilla Paget always has a full caseload, but her motivation is finding justice for the child. When I know that I can put 
someone, a child molester, a rapist, a child abuser, when I know that I've got enough that I can put them in jail, that is the happiest day for me at work. In Morgan County at the Sheriff's Office, it's a team effort to get an arrest. Both investigator Kayla Brooks and Cameron Williams handle crimes against children. Williams has only been in the special victims unit for less than six months, but he's already seen so much. It could happen to any child. The majority of our offenders are family members or friends of the family. And the abuse online is skyrocketing. More than 25 million sexual abuse images are reviewed by the National Children for Missing and Exploited Children every year. Everyone has access to the internet. While technology has made it easier for predators to exploit children, it's also in a way helped the good guys track down these criminals. I've got friends that are in law enforcement that I can simply give an address to or a phone number to and they can pull it up and see anything that that person has searched. These investigators pleading to parents to do what they can to protect their kids and monitor what they do online. You can never be too safe with your kids. While a conviction doesn't come out of every case, justice is served in some. Coming up, the lasting trauma from those who suffer a lot more than most people could imagine.